the 10th day of April 2024. I'll get there. Hope everybody's doing good. Consider clicking around a little tiny bit. I don't know if it'll make any difference, but I'm only saying that because it's a censorship. <laughs> My video last night, I had uh, an hour after the show, I had 43 thumbs up. It's pretty humble, right? We had 16 views, and we had uh, 43 thumbs up. How does that work? And this morning I get up, we only got 37 thumbs up. And right now I have 40 thumbs up. But a little over an hour after video last night was 43 thumbs up. It's a shocking censorship. But it's not, there's nothing I can do about it. we still got to tell the story. Still got to tell the story of Fukushima. Hope everybody had a great day. It was pretty awful, wasn't it? That tsunami. It was a 1,200 miles of coastline. It was enough debris. It was the size of Texas. It was 2,000 square miles of debris. That's a before and after of Fukushima. And there's a interesting video showed up today which is gonna trickle over into tomorrow there was a three hour and ten minute video and we just got the introduction coming up here in a second I'm gonna play it for you and they're talking about uh, spent fuel management in the United States and everything the United States does Canada has to do it too right unfortunately that's where I'm from Canada we apologize before we even start because I'm from Canada. And my name is Dana Durnford. I'm also known as the nuclearproctologist.org. That you can call in at 709-589-4406. Which is something you can't do on the cow other cowards' uh, videos about nuclear. No descending voices are allowed. <clears throat> Here we go. So we got a video coming up in a moment. It's a five-minute video. And I watched an uh, hour and 40 minutes so far of the full video. And we're going to do the whole video tomorrow. The video is three hours, ten minutes. So it's going to be an early show tomorrow afternoon. Make up for my, uh, my lapse this week of two days. And so that's probably going to be a five-hour show tomorrow. We're going to cover that... Uh, presentation at the House Subcommittee. Opening remarks at today's subcommittee's hearing on improving the management of spent nuclear fuel. They actually had Lake Barrett there, of all people, as an expert witness. Lake is the last, the very furthest thing from an expert witness. Okay, so this is the video. Unfortunately, it come with a watermark because of the software I downloaded it with, my apologies. I can make that go away actually. Just give me a second. I do believe. Yeah, make that go away here in a second. Can't make it go away without expanding across, so I can fix that. And let me get rid of that here very right quick. We don't really need the other people, right? I don't know what I'm going through all that trouble for. All I gotta, do, all I gotta do is go to the, the other screen, right? Or even that won't work, actually. So let's go to the full screen, actually. Now let's play this video. And they're talking about mixed oxide fuel during the video, but I'm not sure. This is the opening remarks. Thank you, guys, for being here. Good morning and welcome to the Energy Climate Grid Security Subcommittee hearing titled American Nuclear Energy Expansion, Spent Fuel Policy and Innovation. This Congress, the Energy and Commerce Committee, has taken a bipartisan approach to the advance and expanding nuclear energy here in the United States. I'm pleased we are holding this hearing to examine a critical piece of our nuclear energy industry here in the United States and that's spent fuel. It's important for the subcommittee to examine the state of our spent fuel policy given its role over nuclear regulatory policy and energy policy more broadly. 
Over 40 years ago, Congress formally established a comprehensive nuclear waste management strategy. In 1982, Congress passed the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, which created a federal government responsibility to dispose of all high-level radioactive waste and started a process for selecting sites. I'm just going to cut them off here. Now, remember, they've had 80 years, 80 years to deal with the nuclear waste. And for 80 years, they have done nothing, only destroyed an ecosystem because the waste is still splitting atoms into the ecosystem, right? So all the fuels in the fuel pools are still splitting atoms. There's no containment. It's truly the worst nightmare you can imagine for a um, planet, for a biosphere. 1987, after the Department of Energy conducted extensive studies of nine potential repository sites, Congress amended the Nuclear Policy Act to focus on Yucca Mountain and Nye County, Nevada, as a site for permanent geologic repository. Unfortunately, no. Yucca doesn't matter because it's no longer viable. It's not viable because it's uh, they had multiple earthquakes close by, and over the last few years they had significant earthquakes close by. So thank goodness they didn't use Yucca Mountain. And Yucca Mountain, by the way, the equation was, was how much heat can it contain for 200 years? Not for a million years, but 200 years. That was the original equation. And they were trying to change it by suggesting they can fill up Yucca Mountain with air conditioners and then they put more nuclear waste into it. Which is crazy, right? Did they even suggest something like that? Because if the heat builds up and the power goes out, you're in a world of trouble. Everything melts down at the one time, at the one place. The political objections of one state, not based on scientific reality, blocked the repository from being relicensed or being licensed. Now, he didn't write this. Somebody else wrote it. He read it. He's a very good reader. He's a good talker, but he didn't read it because there's, there's too much technical stuff there. Rather, and constructed following its formal selection in 2002. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff found that Yucca Mountain Permanent Repository could safely store waste for over one million years. The Energy and Commerce Committee has remained committed to upholding the law. And in 2018, the House passed the Nuclear Waste Policy Amendments Act by an overwhelming bipartisan vote of 340 to 72. Right, but they, they throw the money at the system, but the system, 90% of the money goes to administration and the rest of it is stolen. Uh, my apologies. The current standstill. Ratepayers across the country have paid nearly $50 billion into the Nuclear Waste Fund to establish a permanent repository. Now these ratepayers, folks who benefited from nuclear energy, paid fees, which were baked into the utility bill for the construction of a permanent repository. With interest, ratepayers in my home state of South Carolina had contributed over $3 billion to the Nuclear Waste Fund. This is the third most of any state in the nation. Additionally, as a result of the government's failure to follow the law, American taxpayers are on the hook for up to $800 million annually out of the judgment fund. This breaks down to about $2 million per day. In addition to commercial waste, many DOE sites across the country like Savannah Riverside or Hanford store legacy or defense waste intended for permanent repository. Now I'd like to emphasize that spent nuclear fuel is stored safely on sites, <laughs> but the federal government must fulfill its... It can't be stored safely because it's still splitting atoms. There's no containment. This is why we got a poll tonight asking should... All nuclear power plants, deep geological repositories, and nuclear dumps that are surrounded by farms be closed because you're poisoning everybody at these farms. And almost every single nuclear plant and dump is surrounded by farms, right? Legal responsibility and reduce the cost burden to the taxpayer and the ratepayers. State uh, spent fuel, spent nuclear fuel in the United States also provides an opportunity to be an asset as we deploy advanced nuclear technologies. But you don't have any uh, applications into the regulatory agencies for the so-called advanced technologies, the small modular reactors, right? We've seen the, the nightmare that new scale was. We just stole everybody's investments. That's, that's all that happened, right? And there's no applications in. So how is there 
like again, you, you're putting all your eggs in that basket that doesn't exist, where eventually everything is going to be rotten or broken. When geothermal and other resources are able to be implemented immediately. The technological landscape has shifted since the 1980s, and companies like Oklo and Curio and Shine are aggressively pursuing reprocessing. Again, like reprocessing is illegal in the United States. They're allowed to do it at a couple of laboratories, and it's experimental stuff, right? But it's basically illegal. The, you know, the Savannah River site was supposed to have a mixed oxide site, and that was a dismal failure. And also, where did all the money go? The billions and billions of dollars. And recycling technologies for spent fuel. Spent fuel recycling, especially to support advanced fuels, provides exciting promise for the future of nuclear energy in the United States, especially for the advanced reactor. Like he's literally on a stutter and he doesn't know what he's reading. The halo fuel, the high-level fuel, which is like 15, 17 percent, which is military grade, and in order to get to plutonium mixed oxide fuel, you got to reclaim it from uh, fuel that's already gone through a chain reaction, which is two billion times now more toxic than industrial poison. But if you put it through a chain reaction again, it's insidiously maniacal because when it's splitting atoms. And that's the problem with uh, fuel, splitting atoms. But that reprocessing, we know from Francis La Hague, from the United Kingdom, Sellafield and Donneray, the studies on that shows they polluted the entire Arctic. They polluted it just through that process. And that La Hague, for instance, has 500 security guards. ...that we hear about. Our policy should reflect innovations and advancements. Common sense, maybe. As part of an integrated fuel system that includes a permanent repository. Well, you only had 80 years to work it out. If you haven't worked it out now, you're not going to. Maybe somebody else should. Because how much money have you actually thrown at that? It may seem we're at a standstill, but we should look at this as a moment of opportunity for the United States of America. Yeah, never waste a crisis, right? So the whole thing is fixated on mixed oxide fuel because the, the fabled small modular reactors can't exist without the small, you know, the, the plutonium mixed oxide fuel and very high SA, very high grades. Yeah. The U.S. has always led the world in nuclear energy advancements. The Manhattan Project harnessed the energy of the nucleus atom. That's a long way back. And the Atomic Energy Act of 1954 ushered in the age of... And that's a very long way back. You're not, they don't have any new advancements in, what, 40 years? Post Three Mile The peaceful basically. use of the atom, demonstrating American leadership around the world and the amazing benefits of nuclear power. There is no benefits. It's the most resource-intensive industry in human history. And 90% of the site can't be recycled. And you don't have anywhere to put the waste. It's splitting atoms into the environment 24 hours a day. Every minute, it's from all the nuclear power plants worldwide are hemorrhaging. And all of them are surrounded by farms. We're on the precipice of the next frontier of nuclear energy here in the United States. Recently, the House overwhelmed. Well, you're not on the precipice of a new nuclear renaissance because there is no nuclear renaissance Last year was 507 gigawatts of renewables worldwide, and, and nuclear lost 1.7 gigawatts. It went backwards. Rumbling past the Atomic Energy Advancement Act that ranking member Degat and I put together. And that lady here, she doesn't know a freaking thing. She's reading her script, her book. She doesn't, she's not even able to articulate anything without her eyes glued on a piece of paper. Same as this guy. To advance durable bipartisan policy that will expand nuclear energy. Yeah, nice paragraph there. Responsible and effective spent fuel management is a critical part of the equation. It can help foster nuclear expansion here in the United States. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today on the opportunities and challenges associated with spent nuclear fuel management in the context of nuclear energy expansion. I'll take my last 10 seconds. I've been to Yucca Mountain. I've stood on top of that mountain. I thought, if we can't put the, the nuclear waste of the nation here, we're not going to be able to put it anywhere. Well, this is absurdness to suggest that Yucca Mountain is the only resource available. 
You've been on top of Yucca Mountain. There you go. She is an expert now. The repository was chosen for a reason. I've also been to Hanford. I've been to Savannah River site. There was actually $20 billion worth of litigation on Yucca Mountain. $20 billion. Understand the EM process going on there, the high-level legacy waste that's coming out of the tank farms, been vitrified or being vitrified and needs to be stored somewhere. Again, right, they dumped $1.4 billion of those tanks into the ground, 450 billion gallons, which is equal to an aquarium six feet wide, 518 feet tall, wrapped around the entire planet at Hanford, just as a single site. And in the ground, they have 177 tanks, but they dumped 1.4 million of those tanks, the same size, 300,000 gallons, into the soil. Again, like, these are all straw men. That's arguments. waste that I don't think can be reprocessed as spent fuel. So we have legacy waste that needs to be stored. We have spent fuel that's an asset for the nation that can be reprocessed. But it's not an asset. It's a liability because it's splitting atoms into the ecosystem. Nuclear is, all nuclear power plants are surrounded by farms. All factories, and like these, he's talking about are surrounded by farms or communities, which means everybody, there's endless illnesses and diseases and autoimmune deficiencies and injuries from the emissions constantly 24 hours a day. And used as a fuel. So I look forward to today's hearing from all of our witnesses. I'm not recognize. And then the witnesses are the industry itself, are the propaganda machines themselves. Right, white from the national laboratories in Lake Barrett, a notorious traitor to humanity and the eight million species, let alone Americans. Lake Barrett is uh, Burns in, in in The Simpsons. He's that character actually, and he's reading a script, and so does she. It's it's absurd, and Lake Barrett gets there. And he's the guy who's going to promote it. But his whole legacy is horrific. It's, it's untenable that these people... And he even got the comments turned off. They actually got the comments turned off. That doesn't look great. <laughs> That's kind of weird. What the hell is that, Dana? I got no idea. Let's get after it anyway. And so they turned the comments off. They won't let anybody have a conversation. And there was 28 views when I watched it. That was an hour, I watched an hour and 40 minutes of the full video, rather. Which I didn't start watching until about an hour after that. You know, every nuclear power plant, they should pick up millions of one-ton bags around the sites. You know, what happened to Japan was awful, but it it showed us clearly the shortcomings of nuclear power, clearly. You know, they picked up 30 million one-ton bags, right? And you don't need a tsunami to cause an event. That's the problem. I mean, this was an awful thing that happened to Japan. Everybody... Everybody's aware of that. No, nobody's debating that, right? But it's an awfuler thing that Japan has done, the nuclear industry has done, the International Atomic Energy Agency has done to the entire biosphere and the 8 million species. It's, it's criminal. Every, every facet of it is criminal. Every, every bit of it should be prosecutable, and I can provide the documentation on a drop of a hat, and I do it constantly. So tomorrow... I'm left with no choice but to come out and challenge the full video. I got no choice. I, I can't let it go uncontested. It's simply not acceptable. Somebody has to do it. And it's a shit job, and I get it, I guess. Global nuclear power, and so tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to be here banging away for five hours or so at this shithead nuclear industry. Because there's so many lies, it's not like I can cut out a few lies and, and then quantify that as a challenge. You've got to cover the entire video. So I'll be chopping it up tomorrow morning, get rid of any dead weight, and then we'll go through the meat, which is going to take... 
I guess we'll make up for the first couple of days of the week that I ended up taking off, which is so unusual for me, right, to take a day off, let alone two days. If not really taking a day off, I was burnt, I'm burnt out, I'm burnt out. I'm censored beyond belief, but I have to have faith that humanity exists. And so I do this in blind faith. And there's a small group of us, right? And we keep the pressure going. And there is pressure, right? There is pressure on the industry. Somebody talking, being honest, that's, the industry can't handle it, see? Global nuclear power faces unprecedented challenges. There's no nuclear renaissance, that's for sure. 407 reactors got a total capacity of 365 gigawatts were operational worldwide. So 365 gigawatts is literally irrelevant, and but the, the relevance of it is they're poisoning everybody because they're surrounded by farms, and the radiation is not isolated just to the local farms, despite the fact that there's a a criminal amount of farms around these nuclear disease factories. <clears throat> oh, yeah, bear with me. Fire whip, mate, we're almost ready. So, yeah, good old fashioned stomp down tomorrow on the nuclear industry. Why is almost every nuclear power plant surrounded by farms? Like why why would you do something that when the evidence clearly shows that it's the worst case scenario? That the harm from this stuff is already well documented. So why are the majority of these places surrounded by farms? Which happens to be the poll tonight, by the way, to help articulate that question. Should nuclear power plants, nuclear dumps, Deep geological repositories of budding farms be closed. How can anybody say no? Why would you say no? Like, the evidence is stunningly clear. Just let me give you a little bit of it, a little tiny bit. Because if it gives you too much, the nuclear industry will cry to souls to sleep tonight. There's zero possibility the nuclear industry doesn't understand that it's actually evil. It's, there's zero possibility. That's why you see a few thumbs down, right? Because you have to be pretty stupid to give me thumbs down if you're an honest person, right? So all the studies shows that the food will uptake the radiation. This. This is common knowledge in the academic community. So which makes you wonder why, oh why, is all the nuclear power plants surrounded by farms, right? Wouldn't it? You got all these studies showing you that the food takes the radiation instantly and retains it. And so if you eat the food, you get sick, have to liquidate your assets or take care of your loved ones. And death by radiation poisoning is a terrible illness. And a single atom could invoke or inflict a cancer, an increment. Your body attacks every atom with white blood cells for the rest of your life. And every atom is pulsing energy almost at the speed of light, the gammas, the alphas, the neutrons, the betas. are pulsing energy almost at the speed of light, just wrecking your chromosomes, your DNA, your cells, everything else, every second. And your body has to try to repair that and contain the emission, the sources. Top cancer doctor, nuclear radiation, most curtain-genetic thing that exists. So why are all nuclear power plants surrounded by farms? The nuclear industry was sending out mascots, characters dressed up, grinning bird mascots, to tell the Fukushima children living in the nuclear wasteland that if they gargle water, they're going to be safe from radiation. If, if you eat the poison, you're going to be safe from radiation, folks. Why is every nuclear power plant surrounded by farms when you got all these studies saying don't do that? Where are all the nuclear dumps surrounded by farms when you got nuclear studies showing that that's the stupidest thing you can do? 
Why? And why is it going on for its entire legacy? And why is it continuing today? Why are nuclear engineers, when they build a site, is, well, where's the farmland? Because we've got to go look at it. Because if we're going to build nuclear, we need farmland. Because you can poison people in the supermarkets all over the world. And it's not just the local farm, but they abut the actual facilities. Symmetrically, worldwide, we see this genocidal... New global renewable capacities additions to rise by a third this year, International Energy Agency. Renewable capacities worldwide, this was last year's, uh, 107 gigawatts, largest absolute increase ever to more than 440 gigawatts in 2023. But the new numbers came out uh, this year in January the 21st, 2024. Nuclear goes backwards again as wind and solar enjoy another year of record growth. What about geothermal, I wonder? Nuclear power suffered a net loss of 1.7 gigawatt capacity in 2023. So it lost basically two large nuclear power plants. Whereas renewables had an additional record of 507 gigawatts, which is equal to close to 700 large nuclear power plants. Came online in 12 months. So how can nuclear be a savior of anything? And how can something surrounded by nuclear or uh, farms, the fuel pools are hemorrhaging radiation. The more reactors put in the fuel pool, and they haven't got any containment for decades and decades and decades. So every year, there's more and more radioactive fallout coming out of it. Every day, there's 120,000 liters coming out of these pools. It's simply, it's simply insanity that we're having that conversation again. And now they're talking about reclaiming the uranium. So 507. 507 times 29. What was the math on that? My goodness, I can't remember. Oh, yeah, 507. So last year was 507, right? You got 29 years. They want to triple nuclear in the next 29 years, 2050, right? But if you triple last year's renewables, where the price of commodities have went skyrocketed, doubled and tripled, yet they still got 507 gigawatts came online of renewables in a single year, that's equal to 14,703 gigawatts. Like, that's insane in 29 years. If, if you don't double it every year like it's happening right now, if you just stay at 507 gigawatts a year. Nuclear, you can't build 14,700 nuclear reactors by 2029. You, you'd be lucky if you can build, if they really tried, because that's what they're, they're claiming they're doing, but we're not seeing the nuclear renaissance. We're not seeing the institutions, the educational facilities. We're not seeing the supply networks. We're not seeing the investors. In fact, we're seeing the opposite. We're seeing investors say, no, we're not going to invest in stupid nuclear. What will it take to triple nuclear energy? Well, first off, small modular reactors ain't coming to the rescue. They produce 35%, 35 times more high-level waste. 30 times more intermediate level waste and five times more fuel rods that are high grade SA and are mixed oxide fuel on top of that. And that the emissions from them from the fuel pools, they don't even have a scenario to, to resolve that. That would approximately triple the current install capacity of the world's 400 plus nuclear power plants. Well, like 1200 watts, you're, you're suggesting now that there's 400 gigawatts currently of, of nuclear on the planet, but it's not. It's 364 gigawatts of nuclear worldwide. And it might sound like I'm splitting numbers, but I'm not. We're talking about a lot of reactors to make up for their error. Right? So you know, that's, you're 35 reactors shy of the 400 you're talking about gigawatts in order to quantify 
because each of these reactors are only like the average about 0.89 gigawatts per reactor. They're not like one gigawatt, one gigawatt, one gigawatt. Follow review, video game adaptation is a wild nuclear western. So there's a new video game out, Follow, which is going to dilute the narrative and the searches that I have to do all the time. Because one of my one of my searches is fall, radioactive follow, right? And already now you're getting all the video games showing up, uh, diluting and displacing the actual important information. And that's not an accident. They're not naming it follow for something to do. They're doing that specifically to uh, make the victims that are watching it complacent and making it more difficult for anybody trying to research it to come up with any tang tangible uh, material. Lucky for me, I've been at it for a long time, have accumulated enough, more than enough, to challenge their narratives. In the show's very first scene, a cowboy suited Cooper desperately rides his horse away from the billowing mushroom clouds engulfing Los Angeles, so calling it a nuclear western. And they got all kinds of... Uh, this is a movie, is it, I think? I'm sorry. That's actually a movie, I do believe. That'll take over the search engines for a couple of years now. The melting of the polar ice shifting Earth itself, not just the sea levels. So the polar ice, and there was a comment I noticed here today, asked me was I aware that the polar ice cap was gone. And, uh, well, we do research that, right, from radioactive fallout, but also we know... And I'll explain it to you coming up in a second. Research by a new PhD finds warping of the planet's crust with far-reaching effects. And so think about what is geoengineering. Because geoengineering is well-established. It's where they put, they, they put artificial cloud covers, and they say to reflect the sun in the space, but, but we know what it does. It, it traps the heat in there. So when they do the, the cloud covers over the arctic ice like shelves, you're trapping the heat there. Because the sun is going to come through the clouds. It's not going to bounce off it. It's ridiculous to suggest it does. The heat's going to go right through the cloud. The heat doesn't care about the cloud. The cloud has been cloudier than that for many, many millenniums. The heat comes right through it. And the earth is heat too, right? So you're trapping this heat. And that's what they're doing is trying to melt the glaciers to get their access to the minerals and the resources. That's what they're up to, right? Because this, this science has been around a very long time. They made it rain over the Ho Chi Minh trails for an extra six weeks during the monsoon, for instance, in Vietnam. There's 132 ski resorts in the United States that came trail to make it snow from airplanes. Um, there's a very long history of that stuff. The melting of the polar ice is not only shifting the level of our oceans, it's changing the planet Earth itself. Because you're taking all this weight, right? This mile of solid ice that was on the top of it. Once you displace that, now the, the Earth doesn't know what to do anymore. So it shifts. It doesn't have that weight compacting it anymore. And glacier ice from Greenland and the Antarctic, the Arctic islands melt, Earth's crust beneath these land masses warps as an impact that can be measured hundreds and perhaps thousands of miles away. And Glenn Anthony Milne, a professor of Earth Environmental Sciences at the University of Ottawa, Canada, I apologize again, explains that understanding the extent of the movement clarifies all studies of the planet's crust. So Sophie's work is important because it's the first to show the recent mass loss of ice sheets. Well, well, that's quite an interesting statement, isn't it? So her study is the first to show, and therefore that's important. Why ain't that something? How about my studies, where I went out for six years, four to five months a year on the ocean, without coming home, staying out there, doing the research on, on these incredibly, unbelievably difficult research expeditions, and we meandered through the coastline of British Columbia, from Vancouver, British Columbia, to Alaska, year after year. That was a typical day, because of the perpetual radioactive fallout from Japan. And what did we see? 
we've seen an extinction event of the species. But that's not important. Sophie's is, is though. But going out and seeing an extinction event and quantifying that over six years because the species didn't recover, that's not important at all. No. Going out there and getting the shit kicked out of me constantly every day for four to five months a year, having all the nuclear industry attack me without me being able to defend myself. And my name is literally destroyed right now. You can't look up Dana Durnford without finding the most vile things said about me. But what's, it's more important, these species that are exterminated and never came back because of perpetual radioactive fallout. And we can quantify that because we've done the research for six years. Was it worth exterminating all these species for nuclear power? Of course not. Were these species more important than nuclear power? Of course they are. We, can't, we can live without nuclear, but we can't live without the species. And the plumes, this plume model here covers the entire planet in just 19.5 days. And there's endless plume models like it showing the same thing. And so the research expeditions that we carried out quantifies that we are in an extinction level event. And because the species didn't come back, we checked for five more years, it meant you destroyed the essence of the ocean, the soup of life itself, from perpetual emissions and radioactive fallout that are still going on today from the spent nuclear fuels that are splitting atoms and the meltdowns. I mean, what they got done at Hanford is mind-boggling. That's mind-boggling. 450 billion gallons dumped directly into the soil just alone. That statement on its own is mind-boggling that something like that could happen, right? Let's get back to the story here. <coughs> but hey, don't worry about the research. Just worry about what the media says. Don't, don't worry what the media tells you. I mean, uh, where does this end if we let them get away with lie after lie like they're doing? When does it end? Where do they draw the line? Because there's no one to hold them accountable. Like if I disappear, there's no one is ever going to say, look, they're faking being inside a reactor for Fukushima. And that's the biggest media in Australia. That's the biggest media in the United Kingdom. That's the biggest media in America. And that's one of the biggest medias worldwide for lies for the military industrial complex, CNN. But you got these these journalists, these major medias, pretending they're in a building that doesn't even exist in order to promote nuclear. Because it's not like a banana, it's not like a potato chip, it's not like walking the sunshine, it's not like climbing a mountain, it's not like flying on an airplane. And we should be throwing every one of them out of an airplane without a parachute, shouldn't we? An HK executive, exclusive, inside of Fukushima Diachi, 13 years later, oh my god! Oh boy, oh boy! <laughs> 13 years later, stood in front of Reactor 2. Look at me, mommy! The disaster triggered a triple meltdown. It's four meltdowns. You only count in Reactor 1, 2, 3, and 4, but you got to count the, the two fuel pools at the top of each of the buildings. But you got to count Reactor 4. Reactor 4 doesn't exist despite them claiming they're in the fuel pool 120 feet above the stump, or whatever you want to call that scrap of metal left over there. Because that's scrap metal. There, there's, there's nothing left over there. You're not going to go over there first off anyway because it's lethal doses. You're talking about two fuel pools were at the top of the buildings. They don't exist. This is fake. This is the, like the industry is so completely out of control that they're going out on TV telling you they're in a building that doesn't even need to exist in order to support the nuclear industry. If that's not out of control, what, what is? Like, what is? I got nothing else to compare it to. I don't, I don't got to no, know. There's no other subject on the planet that I can show you where the media pretend that they were in a building that don't exist. On a nuclear, which has corrupted our universities and our medias and our governments, does that. That's it. That's the only industry out there. And it, but it's not tenable. It's not sustainable. 
NHK World's uh, Yanol got a rare look at the state of the reactors. TEPCO has agreed to let us inside the Fukushima Daiichi, but getting there is a challenge. Only authorized vehicles are allowed to get close. So we waited outside for a bus set by TEPCO, which was nationalized by the Japanese government. And it should never have existed, right? They should, they should have been in jail for the crimes that they actually committed. But you want to leave them there because you got to have a fall guy, like North Korea is a fall guy. you got to have TEPCO. TEPCO is the fall guy for the nuclear industry, even though the nuclear industry is fault that it happened. Nobody can access the area around the plant without permission. Think about that statement 13 years later. Oh, no, it's all great. they got people on top of the building pretending they're in the fuel pool. That's normal. That's okay, but you, you can't go there and get pictures and, and take readings yourself. We drove past old empty houses. No, radioactive wasteland. You drove through a radioactive wasteland. Not old empty houses, but a, a radioactive wasteland. Places that used to be people's homes, which you obviously know nothing about. And residents near the plant were forced to evacuate after the accident. This is not an accident. You built it on a fault line where you have a thousand earthquakes every year and, and you've got the continental shelf, you got the, the tectonic plates 50 kilometers off the coastline that does that every once in a while with a 3,000 year legacy of tsunamis way bigger than the last one. You built it in a place where you knew this was going to happen and you put two fuel pools at the top of each of the buildings and you stuffed them full of reactor cores and waited for it to go pop. And then, but you're not attacking humans, you're attacking every species on the planet with this stuff. There's nothing on the planet that has an autoimmune trigger to defend against it. It, it destroys everything with replicating cells. This is not a game. Let me repeat that. This is not a game. Residents near the plant were forced to evacuate after the accident, the event, and tall grass sprouts over the abandoned sidewalks. Yes? And the radioactive pollen fills the air for many months a year. Inside the plant, we had to pass strict security checks. What are you talking about? Got your paper suit? Yeah, okay. Put on a couple pairs of socks, you're good to go. We put on our protective gear. Like, what are they talking about, protective gear? She got she got a pair of glasses. Glasses ain't going to protect you at a nuclear meltdown. The, the atoms are so big, they can go through any mass you can build. You can't build a mass to keep the, the atoms out. It has to be a contained system. You put 200 million atoms in the head of a needle and you can't see it. How are you going to stop one of them from getting through your mask? And not only that, they'll get into your body through your eyes. Finally, we received our dosimeters, small devices to measure the radiation exposures. We had to wear them at all times. Why weren't you carrying Geiger counters? Why don't you bring your own proper ones? Followed by two layers of socks. If that was my family member, the first thing I'd do is grab her, knock her down, shave all the hair off her head and her eyebrows. 30 million one-ton bags. Like 30 million one-ton bags. I know it says 20, 20 tons in a bag, but it's not. It's 30 million one-ton bags. I think I screwed up on that one. And even if you had these fancy suits on, you still can't protect yourself from the gamma shines, the x-rays, the neutron bombardments, the beta rays, the alpha shine. Unless it's six feet thick lid. Finally, we received our dosimeters, small devices to measure radiation. We had to wear them at all times. You should have stuck one up your nose. Man. With our useless gear on, we made our way to the tower, the number one reactor. You need only look at number one reactor to see what went wrong. Like, it's hard for me to comprehend how these people can look someone in the face and say that they're a human like me or you. The building was severely damaged by the hydrogen explosion. The hydrogen explosion is caused by the nuclear meltdown. The meltdown burns, the zirconium cladding burns because they're exposed to air. They can't handle it. 
They catch fire, they burn at around 1800 degrees, which ignites the pellets of uranium plutonium that's inside the rod underneath the zirconium claddings, and that burns at around 9000 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures. The hydrogen is a result of a nuclear meltdown, and you displace all the oxygen. When you reintroduce oxygen, then the hydrogen detonates. Even now, there's twisted metal and debris scattered where the roof used to be. The fuel pool is gone from reactor one. This reactor one in the background here. The fuel pool was, this is 100% meltdown, and the loss of two fuel pools with decades of reactor cores. They're so dishonest, they're so disconnected. Like, why would you take a job like this when obviously you're educated and you get a job anywhere else, you make more money? Why would you take a job like this? What could possess somebody to be this evil? To take a job to come out and purposely deceive their friends and their families and their loved ones and disarm them from being able to protect themselves against something that's invisible and that you can't see it or hear it or smell it or taste it or feel it or touch it or pick it up or throw rocks at it or perceive it. And they're going to disarm them by saying, no, no, we went there, the dosimeters were okay. I had double socks on and, and, and glasses. As a precautionary measure, typical officials quickly ushered us away from certain spots, even though we wanted to stay a little longer. A mom's ashamed. I can imagine that how ashamed her parents actually are. I was 400 unused and spent nuclear fuel are still inside the reactor one fuel pool in a pool of water at the top floor. Now we know why they're doing the story, don't we? There is no pool of water. Like they, they came out, and I'll, you know, I can show it all I want. Let me play the video of them saying that they're in the fuel pool of Reactor 4 at the very top of the building. Right? This is where she said, at the top of the building, on the top floor of the building. That's where the fuel pools are to. Let's listen to these people tell you that they're on the top floor of that building that doesn't exist. It's fun. Trust me. You'll love it. You won't regret it, I swear. Here we go. Where I'm standing is on top of what used to be reactor building number four. The whole of this building was blown apart by a huge explosion. We are here inside reactor four at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant that was severely crippled during the earthquake and tsunami of 2011. ...of the decommissioning work taking place here in reactor four. At the end of our tour, we were checked for radiation exposure. In four hours, I received the equivalent of less than a chest x-ray. 1,500 highly radioactive fuel rods inside this pool. They've got to move them outside of this reactor. How many people think that they're on top of the building? There's nobody, right? Even if you were at the Senate committee today on nuclear fuel, you're still not going to believe that they're at the top of that building. You might pretend that you believe it, but there's nobody going to believe it. And they tell so many lies, I can't keep up with the lies they tell. And they said the finished structure is going to be 65 meters tall, which is the height of the original building. The building doesn't exist. There is no, and the same thing for reactor two. Reactor two was uh, burnt constantly for days inside. They have the heat signature. They have, they already acknowledge it all melted down just because the nuclear regulatory agencies and the International Atomic Energy Agency moved the goalpost last year. That doesn't mean that they're in the fuel pool. In desperation to promote an industry that time is long. It should never existed. Right? They, they knew that when you put the fuel in the fuel pool, it was still splitting atoms. That you should have axed the program right there, because you're going to destroy the entire biosphere in increments. Because this stuff never goes away, but everything else does. A million years from now, radiation will still be floating around, trying to kill anything it can find. Everything else will be wiped out from all these emissions that finally caught up to us. And then the numbers they're talking about at the top of the buildings was 3,450 assemblies. And each assembly, because there's no repository, everything's stored at the top of the buildings, and each assembly is around 1,800 pounds. Right? It's 100 fuel rods that are 12 feet long and 18 feet, 
18 pounds and 12 feet long each. There are 6 million pounds at the top of the buildings. So suggesting there's only 800 tons. Uh, and that's what they're talking about, the total of reactor 1, 2, and 3. So multiply 3,450 assemblies by 3, and then multi multiply that by 1,800 pounds per assembly. So close to 20 million pounds. Lion just comes so natural for him, you can't barely... The reactors weren't the only thing damaged by the tsunami. It swept away, away through the facility, causing widespread destruction. Typically, needs somewhere to safely store the radioactive waste, including fuel debris. But right now, water from the reactors is taking up the pressure space. Right, so the, the tanks were empty. The tanks were built to trick you into thinking that they got the fuel out of the pool. The filtration can't filter radiation. You, know, you can't actually filter anthropogenic man-made radiation. Because like you're pouring water over, you have rain and snow also, and but you're pouring water over the melted reactor core debris inside the reactor. What didn't get thrown out miles away during the explosions. And that that water now is coming in contact with fuel, so it's picking up radioactive particles. And you're going to aggregate that in a filter on a number that most people can't even comprehend. So within an hour, you can't get back inside the facility again. The Areva system was the exact same as the Ulps system, and same as the Siri system. You can't filter it. That was meant to make you complacent. And that in 2013, they said all the tanks were full in 2013 from pumping water up under the reactors, right? The story is not really complicated when you're honest. It's only complicated because they told so many lies. The truth is not complicated. The truth is very clear. All the buildings were destroyed, one, two, three, and four. And then the media going in and pretending they're in a building that don't exist, that's what complicates it. That's what makes it complicated. Here's what they said in 2013 about the tanks. And quite a different story than what they're talking about today. The Fukushima plant sits smack in the middle of an underground aquifer. Deep beneath the ground, the site is rapidly being overwhelmed by water. Beneath the surface, water flows downhill and into the basement of the damaged reactor buildings. There it is contaminated with high levels of radiation. To stop the groundwater flowing on into the nearby ocean, engineers are building an underground barrier. But that is causing the groundwater level to rapidly rise. It's now so high the water will soon reach the surface. Then it will start flowing overground into the sea. This week, the company that owns Fukushima, TEPCO, made this disturbing admission. We understand that this water discharge is beyond our control, and we do not think the current situation is good. Outside experts say it's now clear TEPCO is incapable of handling the cleanup at Fukushima. It's time for the Japanese government to step in. The situation is already beyond what TEPCO can handle, he says. If it were possible to take proper measures, they would have done it already. It's not as if TEPCO is refusing to do what they can. They're doing everything they can, but there are no perfect solutions. Even if the government does step in, it's not clear what it can do. The only other solution is to pump out the contaminated groundwater and put it in storage tanks. But after just two years, the site is already jammed with more than a thousand giant tanks. Most of them are already full up. At least 400 tonnes of new water pours into the site every day. And it's going to continue for years and years. Fukushima's water crisis has only just begun. Rupert Wingfield Hayes, BBC News in Tokyo.
So it's a total different story than the official story of tanks, right? The tanks were built to distract you, to manipulate you, into thinking that they had it under control so there was nothing to worry about. And as I showed you before, so you didn't look at, you don't get to see, unless you find me, you won't get to know that the research expedition shows it's an extinction event. And they done it. It's because that was the tipping point, plus 80 years of emissions from the nuclear industry. Uh, I think it's unbelievably dishonest that she done that. And I, I don't understand why people destroy their lives, why, why they feel they should destroy everybody else's and the 8 million species' life f for that job. It, does, it doesn't resonate for me. I can't comprehend. She should go down and tell the people that had to run away and leave their animals behind and she should go tell the victims that were there spraying regions to bind with the particulates after the explosions who would have died that day. She should go tell their loved ones how nice of a person she actually is. And uh, the, the blooms are, the cherry blossoms are out. They're 10 kilometers away from nuclear meltdowns. They're letting people go back there, and people are so complacent because shitheads like that exist, see? And they'll bring their children back into the nuclear wasteland, and years down the road they'll get sick and die because they believe her. Because they believed in this anti-human, anti-species, anti-earth, anti-ecosystem, or useful idiot or whatever the case may be. Cherry trees in the uh, Fukushima prefectural town of Tomoka's Yonomori district are said to date back to 1900s. It doesn't matter, they're radioactive wasteland. The entire district boasts approximately 1,200 cherry trees and is known as one of the best uh, Sukuru viewing spots in the Tohoku region. April 1st marks the one year anniversary lifting of the evacuation orders from the specified reconstruction revitalization base area which included that little district like you like you, you there's so much radiation released you can't clean it up scratching the surface and putting it in bags is not cleaning up three percent of the land is not cleaning up the other 97 percent were contaminated immediately and that's a, we know this because we have so much documentation on it and attracted many flower viewing visitors. They weren't attracted, they were manipulated and deceived and coerced and then victimized because they went there. It's hard to comprehend these people in the media at incredible degrees. This is the best job they can get is lying to everybody and tricking people into going into a nuclear wasteland so that they can prop up their pension down the road. After all, cherry blossoms in my hometowns are the best. So just because you find people stupid and say stuff like that, that don't make it fact. Like you're talking about 30 million one-ton bags. That town, they picked up millions of one-ton bags in that whole area. which And only 3% of that, rather. So you're in an area that was typically surrounded by millions of one-ton bags, and just because you can't see them, that doesn't quantify that it's safe there. And a lot of these bags, by the way, were only meant to last a couple of years, well, all of them. And there's food growing out of them now, radioactive pollen. These trees are all radioactive pollen. That's what they're created from. We, we know in Tokyo, you're getting 4,000 pollen grains per cubic meter of air. This is radioactive we're talking about. The blossoms back is a sure sign of Fukushima recovery. This blew my mind when I seen that. And they even say it, and I got the video clips coming up, where they say, the fact that the trees are blossoming means Fukushima's recovered. Is 
is a sure sign of Fukushima recovery. But it doesn't work that way. Like, you're not going to go back into that shop now and, and just because someone told you it was recovered. You're not going to go up and play in the hills where there's absurd amount of radiation sequestered. It's, it's just, uh, it's heartbreaking to see that the media is your enemy over and over and over and over. Like, taking the people that are complacent or gullible or, or manipula manipulated and deceived and coerced, taking them and using them as a tool to promote lethal radioactive fallout, I just can't reconcile that. I just can't comprehend that kind of evil. Like, they're from Japan. There's no way they don't understand what they're doing is evil. But that's what being a journalist is, being evil. That's The more evil you are, the more promotions you get. And we, and we know that. Look at, uh, look at the journalists that pretended that they were on top of Fukushima Reactor 4. Each of them make about a million dollars a year. Just got to destroy everybody else's life and you can make a big dollar. Surely there's got to be a better way. I just So Cherry Blossom singles a revival in Fukushima Prefecture, but it doesn't. How, how does a Cherry Blossom mitigate 30 million one-ton bags? How does that actually work? Because I really, really, really need to know. And somebody got a cake shop there in a nuclear wasteland. So they go and interview them, and uh, therefore now everything is great. After a nuclear accident, cake brings a taste of hope. Like it's just such a disconnect. It's it's really difficult sometimes for me. Not to scream. Why don't you go stand on top of those bags and tells me and tell me it's recovered? Go mark on every one of those bags. Dana is wrong. So if you got flowers on trees, and you got cakes for sale in a nuclear wasteland where nobody should be, ten miles away from ongoing nuclear meltdowns, bringing young. Kids in there is child abuse. You have 30 million one ton bags. 30 million. You take one of those one ton bags, put it in the back of a pickup truck, bumper to bumper. That's five rows of traffic around the planet, bumper to bumper, which was only 3% of the Fukushima prefecture land. But the food was banned from 14 prefectures by 55 countries for a decade. And look, it almost looks like a radiation symbol in one way, don't it? There's no irony in that one at all. He's like, oh, yeah, but I make cakes, so therefore everything is great. Come on back. Come down to the, bring your children to the nuclear wasteland. Get sick and have some cake. Cake brings a taste of hope. And... Uh, Mrs. Death herself. And look, they even leave that there in the lower thirds. Look, still there. Well, you can't go back to the graveyards because they're nuclear wastelands. And there's quite a long ways away, by the way. There's 30 kilometers away. But you're going to take children back within 10 kilometers because you've got a cake shop and you've got a few people complacent enough to go there to see trees and plant flowers in a nuclear wasteland and then try to promote and manipulate other people into coming into the nuclear wasteland. It's so dishonest. It's, 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 it should be criminal. It should be a crime. But it's not a crime to poison you with radiation. Look, you still got it on the lower, right? After a nuclear accident, cake brings tastes of hope. Why is that still sitting there? It's not even subtle brainwashing. It's horrific brainwashing. Why don't you go stand there and tell you how tell us how good your fucking excuse the language your cake cake is? 
<laughs> After a nuclear accident, cake brings a taste of hope. Why is that still sitting there? And look at him there, with his poker face on. He's probably never smiled in his entire life. Because he's just a misery machine. And none of them are going to say, look, these are the reactors. Re Re reactor 4, behind me, does not look like this. What does he do every The area there? known for its cherry blossom season was... Oh, okay, let's play that. Let me put, i got to put the headphones on. Make sure your eardrums are not getting blasted. The area known for its cherry blossom season was evacuated after the 2011 nuclear disaster. But we recently... But the disaster is still not over. It won't be over for a thousand years. Years. It's seen a gradual return to normal. But there is no... What do you mean a return to, no, to normal? Right? Because this is pure brainwashing. Well, it's the first time since the 311 disasters that this community was really able to embrace this cherry blossom season where they had the park, where they had the festival um, at the park, as they once did. Um, before 311, um, every springtime, the locals call... Like, these nuclear meltdowns are not going to be over for hundreds and hundreds of years. The emissions ain't going to stop for thousands of years. It, that all changed in 2011. So we're roughly 10 kilometers away from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, which was damaged by the massive earthquake and the tsunami that hit the area. Uh, people started going back um, after 2017, and it's still not completely restored. So we spoke to a few people here. And then you put them on camera, and then used them to manipulate other people into believing, well, if it's safe for them, I'm it must be safe for us, honey. So these, these are monsters. That's the only way you can describe these people. These are actual real-life monsters. And they don't have anybody's good intention in mind, only their own and their bosses. Entry ceremonies were held at many schools on April 8th. Nine first graders, first graders, nine, nine first grade students entered the NAMI Municipal NAMI Elementary and Middle School in Fukushima Prefecture, which is seven kilometers away from the nuclear melt and is even closer than the stupid spot they were to. Classes resumes in the spring in a nuclear wasteland. The number of elementary and middle school students, which has fallen to 10, has increased sevenfold in six years. The school buildings have apparently become too small. Easy Japanese news and translation. Fukushima Prefecture welcomes first graders seven kilometers away from ongoing multiple nuclear meltdowns, where communities 40 kilometers away are still abandoned. It's unbelievable. Inspection of aquatic products imported from Japan this is Hong Kong news. What a what a terrible scam they're running, eh? Ensuring quality, examining imported aquatic products from Japan. So why did, did the products were, you know, the nuclear meltdown happened in 2011. They banned the food post-August the 24th last year when TEPCO came out with the cover story and, uh, and uh, International Atomic Energy Agency came out and claimed there is no m nuclear meltdowns. Everything is in the tank, and, and that whatever's coming out of the tanks is equal to three grams of sugar a year. And so all of these prefectures, you're looking at right there, are banned by Hong Kong. But that's simply not true. And notice, remember, Nagata, Denoto, Nagano, too. They're talking about way up in Miyagi. And uh, Chiba's right alongside of Tokyo, and they even got Tokyo. And so what they're going to do is they're going to test the food themselves, and if it meets their the, the codex standards, which is a thousand atoms per kilogram, 
No samples were found to exceed it to safety limits, so don't worry, but go back to sleep. And I went and checked all their links, the 2024 April links. <sighs> and lying just comes natural to this industry. It, it couldn't exist if it told a single sentence of the truth. And so their, their codex guideline levels in radioactivity are 1,000 atoms per kilogram, 1,000 becquels. And the becquel is a pulse of energy. And so the atom, the physical atoms, the isotopes, can pulse energy every second, some of them for millions and millions of years, right? And the industry likes to manipulate people and say, well, if it's a long-lived isotope, then it's very weak. It's no, can't do any harm. But that's only true in nature. That's not true when it comes out of a nuclear power plant. Take plutonium-239 with a 24,000-year half-life, 240,000-year life. It doesn't lose its energy for 240,000 years. So that, that scam where they say a long-lived isotope is very weak is simply not true when it comes when it's anthropogenic man-made isotopes. So it's even worse, at least like Japan is using a not that they're actually implementing it, but saying it's 100 atoms per kilogram, 100 becquels per kilogram. Hong Kong is using 1,000. Dirty, 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 dirty. And telling the population that the food is banned from 10 prefectures, but it's not banned from anything because everything is checked and none of them is going to be found. And they had endless links there, and I went through as many as I can stomach. And when I finally realized what they were up to, the guideline level, according to the latest version, uh, they're using the World Health Organization standards on the quality of drinking water in Hong Kong. And then when you look at the numbers that they're quoting, you look at the real-time numbers, that's the real-time numbers right there, they're only looking at natural stuff, not anthropogenic man-made stuff, which is what the International Atomic Energy Agency is basing their safety is based on natural stuff, not man-made stuff. So their their rules and regulations are based on natural stuff, when it's supposed to be, obviously, on anthropogenic man-made stuff. And this is how they quantify poisoning your country. It's so, it's so sickening, it's so revolting, it's so hourly mean dose rate. And what they're doing is they're measuring it in microceivers, why would you measure microceivers? Why wouldn't you measure physical atoms? And they do acknowledge the atoms earlier, right? I showed you that. Right? A Beckwell is the atom pulsing energy. But the microceiver is a complete deception. It's completely dishonest. Because the physical atom, like, energy for microceivers is energy. Physical atoms are something you can breathe in, something you can sequester in your muscles, your organs, and your bones. Something that's with you for the rest of your life. And, and there is no half-life in your body. It stays there forever. And, and look, they even got smoke detectors. Emerisium 241, right? Cosmic rays, radon. Treated radioactive water discharge at Japan's Fukushima nuclear plant prompts a meeting in China. And they got, you know, no less than Ralph... They are no less than Rahm Emanuel. Each Fukushima fish, fish amid nuclear wastewater panic down in China. Japan's officials provide a science-based, think about that statement there, science-based explanations of how the discharge has been safely carried out as planned after more than a decade of storage. So they're saying they stored it for a decade in the tanks. The tanks are taking up too much space on a complex. So the plant has begun discharging the treated water and diluted since August the 24th. The only problem with their story is the buildings melted down in the first week and lost the majority of their inventories. So to say there's been nothing released and everything was in the tanks is not dishonest. It's 100% criminal and it's not tenable. They picked up 30 million one-ton bags in just a fraction, 3% of the land in Fukushima prefecture. But the food was banned in 14 prefectures I highlighted for you over there. And these are the large prefectures. 
And they're growing food right alongside of one-ton bags of radiation. Do you got any idea how out of reality that actually is? If you don't, you need to. The tanks were built to make you think that nothing went in the ocean, when in reality, there's nothing left in the site except for little fractions of what was there before. And we know that because he picked up 30 million one-ton bags for starters. Let's look at reactor three. I'll show you reactor four lots. But there's four reactors and eight fuel pools that melted down. There's nothing left. Fuel pools were at the top of the buildings like they said earlier. But then now you got Rahm Emanuel, who's a disgusting parasite. He really is, right? He was the former mayor of Chicago. And look at Chicago now, one of the death capitals of the United States for violence. The meeting comes just after International Atomic Energy Agency Chief Raphael Mariano Rafael Grossi, they got Rafael Twister, visit to the plant in mid-March confirmed that the ongoing discharge has been safely carried out as planned. Like, no matter how safe you try to do it, if you dress up like that, you're still not going to be able to be safe. It needs to be six foot thick. And he got uh, the translator hovering at his shoulder. He's there eating sushi, and that somehow quantifies that radioactive food is healthy, does it? And there's probably people out there that are so complacent that that's good enough for them. I doubt it. I can't quantify that assertion. But here he is. Now he's going around buying it as if he's going to cook his own food. You got any idea how wealthy Ralph, uh, uh, Rahm Emanuel actually is? There's zero possibility he's going to go cook any of this. But this is meant to manipulate people. Look at, look at the press in the background. The vultures, the parasites. And yet the translator hovering at his fingertips the whole time. She scares me, that chick does. Look at him. It's unbelievable that people like this could actually exist. It's unbelievable that the media would come out and do something like that. Well, it's not anymore, but it should be unbelievable that somebody could be that evil is what he's doing there. Smile for the camera. Have a nice day. Rahm Emanuel. The anti-human. He goes down, meets the fisherman, does his little bow. Whoa. <laughs> I get a little cranky sometimes. Genocide, omnicide's got a, that effect on me, I guess. Japanese uh, f diplomat, uh, dignitary, uh, 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 thought I had it right there. He understands the wastewater concerns to the Pacific Islanders, he says. Raised by the Pacific. A Japanese ambassador to Fiji says he understands their concern. They got to do it. They got no choice. It's safe. It's like three grams of sugar. So we fully understand, but given the current circumstances, uh, this is the best feasible way. So we have made our decision to dump it into the ocean. But they've, they've never stopped not dumping it into the ocean. There's nothing contained at Fukushima. It never was and it never can be. You can't contain this stuff. Everything has gone straight into the ocean. If you try to contain it, you can never get back on the site. If you actually fill a tank up with the emissions that we're talking about, you can never get back on that site. Just let me give you a, a little example of that, actually. Seeing as they were rocking and rolling. <clears throat> My apologies. Always oh, takes me a second. Two sievers per liter. And the only time you'll bet it, by the way, 
how can you have two sievers of beta but not two sievers of gammas and alphas and neutrons? And then by proxy, the x-rays. And so a gallon of this walking past it is a lethal dose. If you filter that, which you can't, like the reactors actually detonated and expelled their reactor cores and the fuel pools high into the air. Began in August last year, but no, it didn't begin in August last year. This was March the 14th, 2011, and March the 12th, 2011. That's when it began, the releases. You can't contain it. And so uh, we've been covering this from the get-go, right? But last year, on July the 13th, he came out and claimed that nothing got out of the reactors. That the reactors never melted down, that everything that was released was contained in the tanks. Mm -hmm which, of course, is schizophrenia, but that's their new cover story, and that's that was cooked up by the International Atomic Energy Agency, which a few weeks back on the anniversary, the 13th anniversary, went down to Japan, the International Atomic Energy Agency, to pick up a $20 million check. Not, not the check, the water. They went to pick up a $20 million check. And Raphael Grossi, the International... Uh, Japan is the third biggest donor worldwide to the International Atomic Energy Agency. And for a uh, 13th anniversary bonus, they gave them... It's, it's, there's such a disconnect. And we need to get busy. This, we need to fight for this planet. We can we don't have time to play games anymore. We're in real trouble. This is Earth's last stand we're talking about. We got no options. We have to go to war. We are at war. We're there at war against you. And you need to reciprocate. I know that sounds impossible, but I'm telling you sincerely and honestly, and I'm providing you constantly with the documentation for my assertions. None of this is my imagination. Everything is backed up by perpetual documentation. I'm telling you the story, the actual real story, and I'm providing the documentation. And, you know, many times I wish I had a radio show so I didn't have to work like a dog constantly. I can just do a blah, blah, blah on a radio show, and that's good enough, right? But I can't educate the population and the policymakers and the investors and, and those who are concerned with a radio show, I don't feel. So I have to do it the hard way and provide the documentation. So they said the 1.37 million tons of wastewater stored in the tanks is equal to 2.2 grams of tritium. And that if you dumped everything that came out of the reactors, it was equal to 3 grams of sugar going into this ocean. And that's a, a professor in South Korea, of nuclear and quantum engineering last year. This was July the 13th. And this is this was the first English version of the story that we've seen. But shortly after that, the International Atomic Energy come out and said there is no meltdown. Nothing got out. Nothing got out of these buildings. But when we look at the buildings... It's clear everything got out of the buildings right away, too. So saying that the emissions from that and the eight, the four fuel pools at the top of the two buildings was equal to three grams of sugar, is you, you need to be concerned. The, the, the ambassador from Japan to the Fiji Islands said his government worked to ensure proper checks and balances, but what are you talking about? checks and balances, you say nothing got out of the buildings and that is equal to three grams of sugar. That's your idea of checks and balances. Right, Rami Manuel, which is an ambassador from Japan, from America to Japan, is doing the same thing in his, his side of the table. So you got all these ambassadors going around the world telling people that it's equal to three grams of sugar and they're eating some fish and that quantifies that there's no adverse side effects. But it doesn't. 
Scientists warn of an ecological collapse after a record temperature spike in Antarctica, too. So the polar caps are almost disappearing. You've got uh, Antarctic, which has been heavily contaminated by La Hague reprocessing facility in France, and the Don Array in Scotland, and Sellafield in the United Kingdom, and who knows what else. After researchers on the East Antarctic Plateau documented a record temperature jump on March to 18, 2022, warning bells are being sounded about an impending ecological catastrophe. On March 18, 2022, scientists at the Concordian Research Station in Antarctica measured the largest temperature jump ever recorded on Earth, a 101 degrees Fahrenheit temperature jump. According to the measurements made by the polar researchers, the region experienced a temperature rise of 101 degrees Fahrenheit above the region's seasonal average in a climate that's supposed to be perpetually cold, right? 101 degree jump, the largest ever recorded on the entire planet. This figure set a new world record and has frightened researchers. It frightened the researchers. Well, that's crazy. It's interesting because multiple nuclear meltdowns losing their entire inventories doesn't concern them, doesn't play a part of the equation. It's only equal to three grams of sugar, according to the nuclear scientists and nuclear quantum engineering professors is mind-boggling. Oh, that's what they said. It was mind-boggling. Look at that. They're just beautiful, do they? Isn't that beautiful? It's amazing. Nuclear is now an obsolete to delivering Net zero. One of the few honest statements we'll ever see, I'm sure, for a long time. <laughs> Nuclear energy has been touted as a key to the global transition, but concerns about cost and time scales have generated skepticism. Well, yeah, there's definitely some skepticism right there, isn't it? I mean, just 30 million one ton bags picked up should tell you nuclear. Is a, is a threat to humanity and the 8 million species on its own. Nuclear energy provides about 10% of the electricity globally. And, and it's a neat trick how they done that. As reactors are going offline, they're cranking up the reactors that are old and brittle. And they're very high pressure, 1,000, 2,000 pounds per square inch in the containments. So cranking these things up as they get older is the opposite. Because the original charters for nuclear plant was 30 years because they recognize the Wigner effect of the constant bombardment of neutrons and betas rays and gamma shines and alpha burst compromises the atomic structure of the containments. Around 25% of the world's low carbon electricity, but nuclear is not low carbon. Hanford dumped 450 billion gallons of nuclear waste from a chain reaction into the earth, unlined pits right alongside the Columbia River, which feeds tens of thousands of farms downstream on top of that, is enough to build a wall 518 feet tall, six feet wide around the entire planet more than once. Just that alone shows it's not low, it's like, without carbon, you can't have insects or birds or trees or plants or animals. And in fact, the carbon, it's not an issue, and it's not just me. I, I don't make stuff up. I, I don't have an opinion. Well, that's not true. I have an opinion based upon documentation. It's not an opinion. It's a fact. But let's just talk about that assertion for one second. What percentage of our atmosphere is CO2? And so they asked the Senate committee in charge of that, and guess what their reply was? It's very telling. It's a very short video. It's certainly worth watching, and you probably never see it again anywhere else. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Panelists, let me just go right down the vine real fast. What percent of our atmosphere is CO2? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Panelists, 
Let me just go right down the line real fast. What percent of our atmosphere is CO2? Take your best guess. You don't have to be accurate. All down the line. Repeat that question. What percent of our atmosphere is CO2, carbon dioxide? Wild guess. It's okay. I'll bite. Five percent. Five? I'll just follow you then. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go seven. That's my favorite number. I'll see there five and um, suggest that we know that transportation causes 49% of CO2, so that's why we're all working on okay. energy transition. All right. So what number do you think it is? Eh, five. Five? How about you? I didn't hear you, Mr. Oh, Dreher. Seven. Seven. Did you have one, uh, Mr. Boyd? So we got a five, seven... Uh, <laughs> Price is right. Eight. I'm going to get the high end. All right. Well, I, I appreciate that, and I don't mean to I put you on ice. I ask a lot of people that because all we hear is climate change, climate change, CO2, CO2. I heard a couple of you on the panel saying you're looking to change your vehicles to electric, even though we don't have the electric grid. And me as a farmer, I wouldn't be real happy about running out and replacing $300,000, $500,000, million-dollar pieces of equipment because someone wants, someone wants it to be electric. The answer is 0.04%. Not 1%, not a half of a percent. It's 0.04%. And it's gone up from 0.03 over the last couple decades. This is what we're being all contorted into doing is this tiny change in CO2. If we, go, if we get below 0.02, plant life starts dying off. So we got 0 0.04. We get below 0 0.02, plant life can't exist. And none of us can exist without CO2. But what is causing climate change is invisible plumes that covers the entire planet on a regular basis. And this covered the planet in 26 days. It's pulsing energy at the speed of light every second for millions of years. Gas, oil, and coal emissions don't have those attributes. That's climate change, and 80 years of these emissions, like a nuclear power plant's daily emissions can make plumes equal to this. These plumes are not based on the explosion, they're based on venting, for goodness sakes. Nuclear power can't bridge the gap between anything and anything. It's too slow, it's too expensive, and it's a massive distraction. Israel prepares for a strike on an Iranian nuclear power plant. Because they, they bombed the Damascus uh, embassy, which is supposed to be sacrosanct. They bombed it. I mean, what they got done to Palestine, to Gaza, is unbelievable. It's, it's unbelievable how any of them could look each other in the face. And they laugh and they joke and they have a great old time. They have unbelievable great time being monsters. The EU energy projects now are going to bomb a nuclear power plant in Iran. It's unbelievable that they would even suggest it. Well, the Bible says everybody will hate Israelis, and then God will come down and destroy the world to protect them, and only the people in Jerusalem goes to heaven. So guess what they're up to? The EU energy projects podcast, Nuclear Energy Solution, or Pandora's Box, and the people that are in the podcast out of the nuclear community itself. Right? They suck you into the words like Pandora box, and then they slowly manipulate you into being pro-nuclear. That's their, their dream. Nucleo signed an agreement with CEA to develop nuclear technology in France because France can't build anything of their own. It's so ridiculous. And to show you this one here... Uh, I can't remember. I think that's a French nuclear plant. But when you get an aerial shot, they're always surrounded by farms, which is why we have the poles. Should nuclear power plants, nuclear dumps, and deep geological repositories abutting farms, surrounded by farms, be closed? And we got 100% yes. Uh, a few people made a mistake and accidentally voted no, but nobody in their right mind would vote no. The two companies will also work together on fuel qualifications, calculation codes, nuclear materials, instrumentation. Imagine if you took that energy and put it towards geothermal, 
then everything would be solved within the next five years. We would have all the energy you could ever want. And with the rate of 507 gigawatts of renewables each year, which crushes nuclear, because nuclear actually had a decrease 1.7. You know, a quarter of all nuclear plants will be offline by 2025 by next year. They can't even replace them. Nucleo aims, but I'm not going to take a chance, so I'm going to be here to curb stomp this nightmare into the ground as much as I can. Nucleo, Nucleo aims to have 30 megawatt electricity. A 30 megawatt geothermal plant would be up not by 2030, not by 2050, and they're going to spend $3.2 billion on 30 megawatt electric plant. $3.2 billion divided by $4 million a megawatt for geothermal, and that's 800 megawatts for $3.2 billion. And you can have all of it up and running in just a couple of years. You don't need any special contractors. You don't have to... You don't need a whole bunch of specially trained people. You can recycle everything in 50 years. You don't have to store the waste for a million years. $3.2 billion. What will it take to triple nuclear energy by 2050? Funding isn't the only hurdle. There, wait, there's zero possibility. 25% of the reactors that are running right now will be offline next year or the year after. They have no way of replacing them by 2050, let alone having some renaissance. There is no nuclear renaissance. So they're looting the system and stopping us from having a future, or them or their loved ones from having a future at the same time. Nuclear energy accounts for 10% of the global electricity, which it doesn't, and a quarter of the world's low. You can't, like, you can't say that nuclear is low carbon or resor not res resource free. Like, it's the most resource-intensive industry in human history. Every facet of, like, just uh, the cement they're using as size well in the United Kingdom. You can build a sidewalk to roam and back from the United Kingdom. That's how much cement they're using. The amount of steel, like, everything on a site, 90% of it, is too radioactive to be ever used again. And that the site is surrounded by farms, and so they're going to make people sick for 60 or 70 years. Everywhere worldwide they can ship this stuff and that stuff falls out anyway. Tripling global nuclear capacity will require trillions of investment dollars, energy cost competitive, and every nuclear power plant needs two external power plants to supply power to it. These are huge facilities. Each reactor needs a million gallons a minute, 4,500 tons a minute. So they need two dedicated large, full-size, power plants, and that the two the two power plants dedicated to the site to build it. Have you ever seen a construction? Let me show you the construction of these disease factories. It's really something spectacle. It's really something. Try this again one more time. Yeah, I can't remember the name, uh, not Sellafield, but uh, there's two nuclear sites down there, and uh, because I cover so much, that is, I've lost my mind here. I'm just trying to find it. I can't run them all, I guess. Many, uh, Many existing plants are due for decommissioning. 
I'll move on. I just can't find it. I can't think of the name for some reason. So trillions, what are you talking about? Five trillion, 10 trillion, 15 trillion? Let's say seven trillion dollars. So if you take seven trillion dollars and you divide it by four million dollars a megawatt for geothermal, you got 1.75 million watts, which is uh, 1,750 gigawatts. 1,750 gigawatts. So they're talking about 1,200, right? They're talking about 1,200 nuclear power plants to triple it. But it's, that's not even accurate either because it's only 365 gigawatts. Safety. Global interest in nuclear energy is rising. Again, they, they're going to sell you the straw man argument that 22 countries at Constipated Party, Conference of Parties 28, last year, pledged to triple nuclear. So just because they pledged it don't mean that... Because we, we don't see the nuclear renaissance. There's, there's no signs of it. There's Trillions of dollars in funding would be required to achieve about 1,200 gigawatts of global nuclear capacity. Uh, which is 1,200, but you can have 1,700 gigawatts of geothermal in 10 years versus a pipe dream of maybe 1,200 gigawatts of nuclear. Well, of course, you know, it was 507 gigawatts last year of renewables. So in three years, we're going we're gonna to beat that number in just renewables. So why would you even consider nuclear? And the reason I say it, like, if you use geothermal and then back it up with wind and solar for, uh, and then there's all kinds of storage solutions. There's all kinds of other solutions besides that. There's salt batteries, for goodness sakes, where you heat up salt. There's um, volcano rocks, which there's an abundance of, which will retain 3,000 degree Fahrenheit temperatures for weeks and weeks and weeks. Different ways you can store energy, right? But the salt batteries are fantastic because you can store seven, 800 degrees for months in, in sand or salt. And we have an abundance of that we can utilize for storage. But if you took wind and solar, if you took geothermal, and then you back it up with wind and solar and the storage, and there's tons of storage, there's compressed air storage, where you dig mine shafts and you compress air down to the mine shafts. There's water batteries where you build two reservoirs, you fill up the bottom one, and then when you got spare energy, you pump water up to the next one. So these combinations for big cities uh, are the solution. They're flat-out solutions. They're not pipe dreams. They're simple to implement. And then if you give it to the industry, the industry will make it complicated. Don't, don't let them make it complicated. If you dedicated one thousandth of the energy the universities are pumping into fusion and nuclear, if you took one thousandth of that energy and put it in the geothermal, you would resolve any issues you got anyway. And the same thing for storage. Would approximately triple the current installed capacity of the world's 400 plus nuclear power plants, which is only 364 gigawatts, I might add. And that last year was 507 gigawatts of renewables. And only a fraction was geothermal. Geothermal, they don't want the world to think geothermal. They're desperate for the world not to say, well, what about geothermal? They're desperate. Because that's the end of the looting, right, for the nuclear industry. But it's, it's much more darker than that, right? The emissions from the fuel pools are catastrophic. All the fuel pools are hemorrhaging radiation. There's no containment. And they had 80 years to come up with a solution, and then they didn't even try. They don't even have a robot that can go into a nuclear, heavy nuclear environment. That tells you everything you need to know. It's not complacent. It's a betrayal. It's 100%. That's 100% unassailable. But then the poll tonight is another question. It's a very important question. Why is every nuclear power plant surrounded by farms? Should nuclear power plants, nuclear dumps, and deep geological repositories 
abutting or surrounded by farms be closed? And of course they should be. So why would anybody vote no? How could you vote no to something so sinister? Well, that shows you the pro-nuclear community, absolute contempt. To come here on a videos where I get no views, I get very few thumbs up, and my, like my video last night, an hour after the show, had 43 thumbs up. Tonight it only got 40. This morning it had 37. When my show was over, it had 16 views, but 37 thumbs up. Well, tomorrow we're going to cover, I mean, we get the study saying how stupid it is to have nuclear power plants surrounded by farms. You've got so many studies pretending that that's not happening is, is, is not stupid, it's not blind, it's not on purpose. It's, it's a monster. You have to be a monster to ignore it. You have to be a monster to pretend that it doesn't affect everybody you love. Because that's all you're doing, right? You're pretending that it doesn't affect everybody you love. And pretending it doesn't affect everybody you love is a slippery slope. And pretending it doesn't affect the 8 million species is an even slipperier slope. And my research expeditions clearly show that this is not a game anymore. That pretending this didn't happen, pretending that I didn't do the research is not a solution. Because anybody who knows me knows how methodical I actually am. Because it's not a game. It's not a pipe dream. <sighs> All righty. Let me see here. Uh, just bear with me one second. I'm not quite finished yet. So tomorrow we're going to be doing a full day. A full day. We're going to challenge a three hour and 10 minute video. I'll be chopping it up tomorrow morning. And when I'm ready, I'm just going to post the show and go ahead and do the show. And you got the whole weekend to get to it. But we got to challenge that uh, committee assertions that mixed oxide fuel is somehow a solution to nuclear fuel. It's not a solution, it's a total betrayal. And it's a total poison of your entire country and the ecosystem. And it's not acceptable. And there's no one out there to challenge it. Not a single person on the entire planet has challenged that narrative. These are drone footages that were released in 2021. And nobody knew why they released these pictures from the drones. But when you zoomed in, the reactors were redacted. And the common spent fuel pool was redacted. But it was worse than that. The common spent fuel pool, as the drone went towards... Reactor 5 and 6, and you zoomed in, you start to realize Reactor 6 is redacted. And the pump house and the stack. Why would you redact all of that? We also noticed another section, which is up right here. Not this spot right here, but this was one of the markers we were able to use to locate it. But see that section up there? That's redacted. Why was that whole section and buildings in the red up there redacted? Because the drone drew a path right up there and a path right back on two different sets of pictures. One was a, a, a direct line with the drone up to here, and another one was a, a, the drone pictures from here back. And so we had these sections. We were able to now put, start putting the picture together, which is over to your left. And we also knew that... 
that section up there like an L shape or an E shape with a centerpiece missing. So we had that section and those two sections, which now allowed us to figure out where that section was too. And when you start realizing all of this was redacted, reactor six was redacted, the common spent fuel pool was redacted, reactor one redacted, reactor two redacted, reactor three redacted, reactor four were redacted. So why did they le release those footages on the 10th anniversary? It was 736 pictures, which I'd done a video about a few weeks ago, by the way, totally on this stuff here. And so when we, we were able to take the markers, now we were able to figure out. But we still don't know what it was because they added on so much material post Fukushima to that area, right? So the majority of that stuff up there don't exist anymore and everything is new. So we don't know what was going on and we're, we're getting there. We've established that there's something highly suspicious going on there. And when you look at the drones, it's only when I zoomed in that I started realizing everything was redacted. And so we originally done a video when this was released, but we updated the video a few weeks ago. Remember, it, it reactor three through the fuel pools, two of them stuffed with decades of reactor cores and the reactor core that was running ejected it out of the buildings. And they very easily could have showed up at the other end of the site, right? Very important stuff. And we can't, and that was a mixed oxide fuel, like they're promoting now at the Senate committee. <coughs> ooh la la, ooh la la. Oh, well, there you go. That's it, that's all of it. So let's look at the poll. We got that there somewhere. Should nuclear power plants, nuclear dumps, and deep geological repositories abutting or surrounded by, nu by farms be closed? Well, yes. Obviously, Dana. Let me thank everybody for participating in the poll. And that if you made it this far, please remember to give us a thumbs up on the video. We have so few. So so uh, much work to do these stories we hope that more people will watch it we know that more watch it but the numbers are censored like i say last night i had 43 thumbs up on the video when i went to bed an hour after the show when i got this morning i only had 37 thumbs up and tonight i only got 40. and so <sighs> we'll catch everybody now i'm going to be doing the show tomorrow i don't expect everybody to show up it's, it's not very far away. I'll be doing the show. Uh, it's about 12, about 12 hours from now, roughly. I'll be going live, hopefully. And then we're just going to go through a three-hour, 10-minute video that was posted today by a committee in the United States Senate that is promoting radioactive recycling, which is illegal, by the way, in America and Canada. And it's so terrifying such a terrifying process that we need to challenge the lawyers and some of these lawyers are very well known around here and we've covered them many many times we'll see everybody in the morning have a great night great day tomorrow uh, we, we had bad weather here for the last week so I can't get much accomplished anyway but I'm starting to get my energy back here to like yesterday and today. That's not much yesterday, but certainly today. And so we'll get after it. I'm going to run myself into the ground tomorrow and go after that video. Have a great night. Hugs for everybody. Take care. I'll see everybody tomorrow. Take care now.